the Bureau of Land Management presents live from its National Training Center in Phoenix, Arizona, Reaching Common Ground, an interactive forum for resource advisory councils. Featuring Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt, and Acting BLM Director, Mike Dombeck. And now, the host of your program, Larry Hamilton. Welcome to Reaching Common Ground. We're very excited about today's program and what this means for the future of our public lands. Joining us today is Secretary of Interior, Bruce Babbitt. Bruce, it's nice to see you today. It's great to be back in Phoenix. I'm glad you <clears throat> picked this place, my home. Good. We'd also like to welcome BLM's Acting <coughs> Director, Mike Dombeck. Mike, glad you could join us. Hey, thanks, Larry. It's great to be here. Good. It's also Mike's birthday today. Happy birthday, Mike. Well, thank you. In today's broadcast, we will not only be visiting with the Secretary and the Director, but we will be discussing your roles and responsibilities, as well as the importance of your council in helping us manage our public lands. Later in the program, we'll be looking at the development of standards and guidelines, and a member of the Arizona Resource Advisory Council will be joining us. But most importantly, we will be hearing from you as you call in your questions and comments. First, Secretary Babbitt, this is a very special day for us. Maybe you could share with us how we got here today. Larry, thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased to uh, join you and my, uh, Mike Dombeck and all of the members of the uh, Resource Advisory Councils. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank each and every one of you for uh, accepting uh, these appointments. I think uh, it is a uh, great opportunity for us to begin the process of coming together and finding uh, this common ground in the West. Uh, it's going to be a substantial and complex job, and uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge at the outset that it's going to take some time and effort and uh, my gratitude for uh, your willingness to participate. What I'd like to do just briefly is talk about a couple of really important ideas that have led us here today. The first one is, is, I think, an obvious one, and that is that I think every Westerner, everyone who has grown up and lived close to the land in the West, has always felt that land management on public lands really ought to come closer to home, that better decisions are going to be made closer to the ground uh, with the involvement of uh, uh, ranchers, uh, people in the mining industry, the timber industry, uh, local officials, uh, people who live and make their living in proximity to the land. Uh, and uh, I agree 100 percent with the uh, criticism that I grew up with in a ranching family that I heard as governor of Arizona and that I sense today in the West, and that is that uh, we really do have to find some way uh, to discharge national responsibilities, but in the context of genuine uh, local participation. Now, the second idea that has come I think to be very much a part of this process that we, or this journey that we begin today, is the notion that we must find consensus. That as we bring management in a shared fashion back to the West, we need to try to come together and find that common ground. Uh, I think we all recognize that uh, the West and Western communities uh, have really suffered for this intense antagonism that has come to characterize public land debates. Uh, and what happens uh, with these endless antagonistic fights is that when, when Westerners in local communities can't find common ground, the controversy inevitably gets bucked up to Washington. And that means that in one administration, uh, the, the livestock uh, uh, interests will uh, dominate, uh, the wheel will turn, uh, the sportsmen will, uh, will come to dominate, or the environmentalists, or the mining industry. And what we lack is stability on the land. We never really become in charge of our own destiny. Uh, Ken Spahn, who's a rancher up in uh, Gunnison, Colorado, really taught me that during the meetings that we had in Colorado uh, uh, last year. He was passionate about saying, Bruce, we must, as Westerners, take charge of our own destiny. Because if we don't, someone else will. And we're not going to be in charge of our destiny until we are together, all of us, on that landscape. That's a relatively new idea, 
but I think it's crucially important. I know it's going to be difficult to find that consensus, uh, but I just want to say to you that I'm pledged to do everything in my power to empower these groups, uh, to work with you, and to relentlessly say, our future has got to be in our hands. And that means consensus, because otherwise, uh, it will inevitably drift off uh, to someone else. A uh, couple of other just very brief thoughts. I'd, I'd like to remind myself and you that the Resource Advisory Councils are, by law, charged with advice on all kinds of land management decisions, land use plans, oil and gas, uh, minerals, timber, and that as this process unfolds, uh, the BLM, uh, Mike, Larry Hamilton, the state directors, are going to be enlarging uh, this discussion to include uh, the entire spectrum uh, of uses on uh, Bureau of Land Management lands. For the moment uh, and today, uh, I think properly uh, grazing uh, is our first concern. And just a brief word about grazing. Grazing has always been a part of the Western landscape. My personal view is that grazing is good for the land, that properly conducted grazing can, in fact, enrich the diversity of both communities and the landscape. And that what we must do uh, is use common sense, on the ground knowledge, good science, to make certain that the public understands that and to make certain that we have a consensus and that in the process we deepen our commitment to ranching, the role of the ranching economy, and above all, the understanding that this landscape has co-evolved with grazing animals and that it's a stronger and richer and more healthy landscape uh, for having proper grazing um, on that landscape. Now, what you can hear today is, is a discussion uh, in which uh, we're going to lay out some of these standards and guidelines concepts and begin the process uh, with all of you. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Mike and Larry for being here, the state directors, uh, and challenge all of you uh, to begin working on this process, uh, finding consensus uh, as partners uh, on the Western landscape. Thank you. Well, Mike, we've heard the Secretary's vision and some of his expectations for resource advisory councils. How do you see them helping the Bureau accomplish its multiple use mission? Well, Larry, I think uh, three points I'd like to made, uh, make on that is just the, you know, we need to move the decision making processes close to the ground as we can. It's sort of common solutions to common problems for the common good. I think the other point that's important is balance. Uh, the fact that uh, all interests are represented, the people that work on the ground, the people that live there, the people that have an interest in the land. And the third concept is consensus and collaboration, as Bruce mentioned. Uh, uh, people working together, educating one another, uh, discussing problems, uh, not always agreeing on solutions, uh, but moving uh, forward understanding what they do and working together but I think first and foremost is is people that, that live on the land in the states in the regions in the BLM districts on the watersheds uh, working together to understand that there's a place for everything there's a place for all of those folks there and that we know how to do most of these things and uh, we just need to sit down and talk about it and understand one another and just move forward and I think the the advantage is is that the land will benefit and when the land benefits, we all benefit. And how does that sound to you, Mr. Secretary? Well, I think it's a tall order. I, I mean, I think we ought to be realistic. This is, uh, this is going to be hard work because uh, we have allowed ourselves to drift into these incredibly antagonistic things. We have resorted on all sides uh, uh, to lawsuits, to rhetoric, to uh, uh, bucking these problems up to Washington. I've got to tell you, there are some encouraging precedents. Uh, I think particularly of the uh, Trout Creek Mountain uh, uh, group uh, in Oregon, uh, the Gunnison group in Colorado. Uh, there are actually quite a few of them around. Uh, uh, the CRM process in Wyoming, uh, there's one uh, up in Flagstaff uh, uh, in my hometown. And I think what we need to do is kind of learn from these experiences and, and recognize that this is an evolutionary process. What we want to do is find the best and begin to work it into the culture west wide. Uh, shortly, we'll begin taking your calls, and those of you who have a question or a concern, this would be a good time to call Bruce and Mike. So let's uh, start seeing the, the lines light up here in a few minutes. Uh, many concerns, Mike, have been raised about 
these councils as being truly representative of the many public users and interests. Uh, how do you respond to these concerns? Well, I think, uh, you know, over the years we've learned uh, and we've seen examples, and as Bruce mentioned, the Trout Creek Mountains, and I've got to tell you, uh, when I went to the Zimmerman Ranch, Bruce, uh, it's the first time I've been on a, uh, a ranch where the driveway was 25 miles long. And uh, as, uh, as Evan told me, he said, you know, he said the first uh, several meetings, we kind of hollered at each other. But uh, we listened, and we got together, and, and uh, a couple years down the road, they avoided some major problems. They avoided litigation, and they learned how to, how to work together. And we've got examples like that in various places in the country. And uh, what we need to do is build on that. I think the, the meetings, uh, the, uh, the Colorado Roundtable, the Wyoming uh, folks, and w we learned from these kinds of things and all the, the trips that you made out west, the, the endless uh, travel and, and so on. And uh, we've learned a lot from this. And what we need to do is we need to apply this and try to help others uh, move forward with this. And uh, uh, people have worked together and, and made progress. Uh, the open, accessible decision-making process, I think, is very important. Uh, the fact is, the money that's spent in court does not benefit the resource. And, and if anything, we've learned from the past is by uh, bringing people together and uh, bringing the interest together and spending the money on the land. That's what's really important. I think another point that's key is uh, the one-size-fits-all concept, the fact that, you know, it's a lot different in Montana where you're from, Larry, than it is uh, here in Arizona, and uh, the concept that uh, folks will work together and, and work, use what works best locally, I think, is, is most important. And uh, speaking of the word local, I think, you know, folks that live on the land, I grew up in a town, uh, or in fact, uh, 25 miles from a town of 1500 in northwestern Wisconsin, and uh, we understood uh, the landscape, we understood uh, of the woods. That's the land of the big woods, as a matter of fact. And, um, and that's why I think gaining local expertise and getting local people involved uh, is the most important thing. And that's how you get lasting solutions. And I want to want to reaffirm uh, uh, Bruce's point about a lot of times this isn't easy, but I think it takes, you know, the fortitude and the willingness of people to sit down because uh, the benefits of this are, I think, tremendous. The benefits of this will, will go on for generations, and I think future generations depend upon the success of this kind of collaborative approach. You know, several weeks ago we had the uh, designated officials here at the National Training Center as part of getting ready for today. And one thing that we asked them to do uh, after they left here was to contact their individual resource advisory council members uh, and see exactly what was on their mind. That Maybe they had some questions that we need to, to incorporate uh, into this presentation today. And one question that came up quite a bit, and I know it's something that both of you have been interested in, is, is there a better definition of ecosystem management that we can work with? Well, <clears throat> look, I think ecosystem management uh, is a fancy word uh, for common sense. It's a fancy word for saying um, a uh, cattle operation, typically where I grew up, runs on, uh, of, on a forest permit uh, during the summer, uh, probably on a BLM permit <clears throat> during the winter season, uh, probably has uh, some state lands, uh, some private lands, and may even be leasing some lands. And uh, what every rancher does is try to assess the carrying capacity of the land and build a management program uh, that looks at the entire system uh, uh, that you're uh, grazing in. And uh, same for fisheries, same for anything else. So uh, I guess I uh, would uh, simply say there's a lot less than meets the eye in that phrase, uh, and, and maybe more than meets the eye when it comes to actually common sense out on the land. I think the secretary used the magic yeah. word there when he said fisheries, and uh, since you're a fisheries biologist, uh, what do you think, Mike? Well, you know, ecosystem management I think, can be confusing, but a lot, a lot of words, technical terms, and things that we go to college to learn and, and then come back and need to apply, uh, we need to, to simplify it to the greatest extent that we can. And, you know, when I think of ecosystem management, I think of, you know, less soil erosion, higher water tables, greener riparian areas, increased weight gain in livestock, better hunting, better fishing. If you look at the basic function of a watershed, you can really sum it up fairly simply. It's to, it's to catch, store, and release water over time. And what could be more important to all of the interests on the land, the, uh, than, than water and uh, 
healthy functioning streams that are the circulatory systems of, of the watersheds. And, and uh, in addition to that, you, in ecosystem management, we uh, sort of vast recreation opportunities, protecting our cultural heritage, the, uh, the history that we share on the landscape, and all these things. Uh, to me, it's, it's not a complicated thing. It's people that are working together, using the best information that we have, and applying it to the land in a common sense way. Okay. Um, the phone calls here are stacking up. I think probably we need to, to start taking a phone call here. And Roy, in Idaho Falls, are, are you there? Roy, are you there in Idaho Falls? Yes, we are. Do you have a question? First of all, thanks for the opportunity in talking to you like this. The question that we have is, uh, how will the decisions of these 24 RAC groups affect the outcome of the uh, grazing legislation or the decisions that the Secretary of the Interior are going to ultimately make? Roy, I, I see two <clears throat> really good questions here. Let, let me first answer uh, in terms of my, my regulatory authority and the Bureau of Land Management. Um, the structure of these uh, Resource Advisory Councils is set up uh, with a commitment from me that if you find consensus, uh, we're going to listen to you. And uh, there are a number of avenues built in uh, for direct appeal uh, uh, to me if you feel that the state director uh, is not uh, 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 listening uh, to that advice. Uh, and, you know, I, if I detect a note of skepticism in that question, I understand because uh, advisory groups have been a dime a dozen uh, for the last 50, 60 years everywhere you turn. Uh, I think we can do it differently this time. Find consensus uh, and uh, we will uh, use the advice and my admonition the state directors will be to move in and work this out, express their concerns, and in this interactive process where you find consensus, uh, uh, we're going to act in exactly that way. Now, the honest answer about Congress is I don't know what's going to happen in Congress. There's going to be a, a long play out in this session. Uh, there may or may not uh, 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 be legislation. Uh, it may or may not uh, affect uh, uh, this process, but uh, what I'm saying to the uh, to the Bureau and to all of you is uh, let's move forward. I mean, surely this process is a correct process, uh, and we can learn as we go. And to the extent that Congress uh, can learn from what we actually do, uh, that'll be fine. And to the extent that Congress decides to modify it uh, uh, in the form of legislation, well, that's fine too. Uh, but in the meantime, let's just sort of uh, uh, understanding that uh, we don't know the absolute uh, a range of outcomes, let's, let's get started, because anything we do is bound to be an improvement uh, over doing nothing. You want to respond to that as well, Mike? Um, what I'd like to say, Roy, is that uh, I think the BLM uh, folks that you work with on the ground, the, uh, the range conservationists, the resource area managers and others are, 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 are committed to, to work with people, and that's, uh, you're the folks, the taxpayers that pay our salaries or the uh, not only the stockholders but the owners of the of the public lands and I think it's important that uh, that we work at the local level and I think this is this this is a, a trend that we need to be responsive to and my direction to all of the BLM employees Bruce is as we did at the summit and other places is that that you're you're to work in your local communities to get out on the ground to the greatest extent that you can and uh, and work with local people because uh, uh, what's good for the land uh, uh, regardless of, of uh, what goes on in Washington is good for the land and it will benefit all of us. Okay. Amen. John in Salt Lake City, welcome. You're on Thank the you. air, John. Thank you. Would you tell us how these new councils uh, differ from the previous advisory boards in both their procedure and their objectives? Yeah, look, I think that's... Uh, that's a fair question. Uh, it, it sort of goes back to my prior comment about uh, you know, the history of these advisory councils. Uh, first of all, we, we really made a, a, a strong effort to make sure that they are uh, absolutely representative. Uh, we've drawn the governors in. That's, uh, that never happened during the nine years that I was governor in Arizona. I mean, I uh, never knew there was such a thing as a BLM uh, advisory committee. So we, we've drawn the governors in very close, and that's a way of saying we really want these things to have some political, in the nonpartisan, in the general sense, a clout uh, by virtue of their association uh, with uh, state and local governments. Uh, 
Secondly, this concept of consensus, uh, what I've effectively said is uh, this is going to be more than just advice. When you find consensus, there's going to be a heavy presumption that Larry Hamilton uh, is going to uh, either uh, incorporate that advice or explain why he chooses not to. And uh, there is a provision uh, which allows the Resource Advisory Committee uh, to come straight to me uh, and under the regulations uh, uh, demand uh, a written response, uh, effectively uh, uh, drawing me into it. Now, I hope with all of that uh, we can uh, guarantee that this is not going to be just window dressing, uh, that it is real, direct, and meaningful. I completely agree. How could I disagree with my boss? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you, 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 you have. You usually do. <laughs> and he makes me nervous when he points his finger at me, too, so I want you to be aware of that. Jeff in Susanville. Jeff, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning. You have a question for us? Yes, we do. We'd, uh, since multiple use is the under, uh, underlying principle of management of land in the, by the BLM, we'd like a, a definition of what that exactly means and how parity for all uses on public land would be achieved. Well, uh, that's got about 100 years of, of history behind it. Look, multiple use, uh, the definition is real simple, and that is that uh, all the, the land is is available uh, for uh, all uses, uh, and uh, all uses should should be maximized to the extent that they don't directly conflict uh, uh, with other uses. Now, uh, the difficulty, of course, comes when uh, uh, someone shows up and says, "I want to strip mine uh, the eastern half of uh, Wyoming," and uh, uh, th th these are kinds of things that actually happen, and then you're driven to uh, a discussion of uh, the relative. Uh, importance and precedence of mining versus grazing. Uh, you can get that with timber. Uh, you get it all the time with recreation. Uh, and it's an increasing problem in the West because there are more and more users. I mean, you know, when my grandfather was uh, running the CO bar in 1910, there wasn't anybody there. There wasn't even a BLM agent. Uh, uh, there certainly weren't any recreational users, and uh, life was pretty easy. Uh, these conflicts are going to come up more and more. And my, my short view of this is that that's what the BLM land use planning process and the RMP process is about, is laying out uh, how it is you, on the ground, as a practical matter, uh, work these things out. And I hope that's something that the Resource Advisory Councils will get into uh, just as soon as we get this grazing thing teed up and moving. Uh, I think the next discussion ought to be about uh, participating uh, and shaping uh, uh, land management plans, because that's really where these uh, issues are going to get addressed. And, uh, the outcome, I think, is, is really uh, very local and very site-specific. You know, Jeff, I'd like to say that, you know, this concept of multiple use uh, that you mentioned is where all of the uh, resource advisory boards need to help us and uh, uh, the resource advisory councils because, you know, the, the changes in the West, the increasing population, the uh, increases in uh, the numbers of people all around the West and so on, it makes multiple use management more challenging because you've got more people that are interested in what it is uh, that's going out there on the land. They're, they care about the health of the land. And uh, to help us bring them in in a collaborative way uh, so all interests are heard, I think is going to be a real challenge. And, uh, you know, uh, this, this isn't going to be a piece of cake, but I think with, uh, with a solid commitment that you have from us, and, and I hope from the Resource Advisory Council members, Larry, I hope that these uh, makes this challenge somewhat easier, but it's, it's still not going to be a piece of cake. Mike, I'll tell you something. It just occurred to me. I, I was up in the Sweetgrass Hills in Montana uh, uh, last week, and talk about an on-the-ground example. It's, it's an incredible place. Uh, prime ranching country, prime farming country, uh, prime heap leach mining uh, uh, country. A couple Indian tribes have important uh, uh, claims. Uh, there is water development in the uh, Sweetgrass Hills, and uh, I walked away from there saying, the, the, this is kind of emblematic mm -hmm. of uh, what we're going to be dealing with all over the West. Okay, let, let's go from uh, Sweetgrass Hills to Riverside. Bob, are you there in Riverside? Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate the opportunity from the Desert District Advisory Council to have this forum. Uh, you raised the issue of mining this morning, and of course you've been a strong advocate of changes to the mining law. Further, you've been outspoken critic of 
uh, current legislation that's been proposed in the Congress. And my question is, what plans do you have to work with the Congress to get changes to the existing law? And what role do you see for the advisory councils in that process? Okay, um, here's my thought on that. I, uh, the mining law uh, debate is obviously really underway now. And I think when it comes to advocating legislation, that you know we ought to all feel uh, free to take our own individual uh, positions. Whether or not a resource advisory council ought to get into uh, advocating legislation, I think it's something you should discuss. I, I guess I'd come out on the cautious side and say that if we're looking for consensus, what we really ought to be doing is asking what are the management issues that we need to be working on. And uh, in the case of mining, that would be looking at uh, the land use planning process. Uh, and uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, I invite you to discuss whether or not you want to uh, a, a lobby Congress I, uh, as a group rather than as individuals. I guess I'd be a little, uh, little cautious on whether or not that's really going to help us uh, advise guys like Larry and state directors who uh, aren't in, really in that business in the first place, whose real job is to administer the laws we've got. That's a good lead-in to, to Butte, Montana. Uh, Bruce, are you there in Butte? Bruce, you're on the air. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary, our question uh, from the Butte RIC is related to the first couple questions you have, but we, we're looking for a few more details in a response. And that is, how will the BLM specifically demonstrate that it is going to use our advice and what are the sideboards, legal and otherwise, uh, that would limit the agency from adopting any of our recommendations? Okay, the, the first one, uh, how do they demonstrate? Look, uh, I think that this process of, of starting down the road toward uh, building consensus uh, requires a certain amount of mutual trust and that, uh, frankly, we got to go at this uh, by looking each other in the eye and saying, we believe uh, that we can establish uh, some common ground and we have confidence that we're all here uh, in an attempt to work together. Now, I, I really think that precludes, uh, you know, a long discussion about the, you know, what your credentials are and what it is that uh, you have said or the person next to you has said uh, over the last uh, uh, 10 years and all that kind of stuff because then pretty soon you're arguing about history. So I, I would say let's trust each other uh, on the way in. Until proven otherwise, let's assume we can make this work. Now, uh, what are the sideboards? Well, the sideboards <coughs> uh, are legal, obviously, uh, and they go back to uh, the, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, uh, uh, the various uh, uh, laws that have been passed uh, that relate to that. And uh, those laws, uh, particularly uh, the Land Policy and Management Act, says uh, these are advisory councils. Now, I suppose a thousand lawyers can argue about what's meant by that. And again, what, what I would say is, let's try it. Uh, rather than saying, uh, can we order Larry Hamilton to uh, increase permit numbers, to modify an RMP, I think we ought to just say, let's go at this and see how far we can go in a sense of, of mutual trust and confidence. And what I'm saying is, if we can do that, uh, he's going to listen, and you'll see the difference. Okay, we've got a question here for Mike. Uh, Fran, are you there in Albuquerque? Hello. Fran, good Hello. morning. Good you're morning. On, you're on the air. Buenos dias from the land of enchantment of New Mexico. All right, Secretary, the question that has survived seems like you've answered so many of them that we had on our list. What does the Secretary perceive to be the singest, single biggest issue facing BLM today? Uh, Fran, if, if I may, I'm going to give that question to, to Mike, and then we'll see if he gets it right. <laughs> 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 well, this is a test here. Actually, we have so many issues on the, the platter, Bruce. Uh, uh, it's a uh, it's interesting. I think the uh, the single biggest thing that BLM needs to do is uh, is uh, you know our commitment to uh, the taxpayers, to the American people, is uh, is the health of the land. And, and my my uh, themes that I've been pushing in the 
a year and a half than I've been in this job as an acting director is, is maintaining the health of the land and improving the way we do business. And uh, we need to do that by involving people uh, every inch of the way. Uh, we've got a, an agency full of, of resource management experts, people with associate degrees, bachelor's, master's, PhDs. And, and what we need to do is we need to blend that skill uh, with the needs of the local communities with national interests and move forward uh, for the health of the land that my employees are probably tired of hear me, hearing me say those words but because that, that's just the bottom line that, uh, that we need to work toward. So I would say that's probably my, my top priority. Now, did I get that right, Bruce? Mike, I'll give you an A for that. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, now I'll have the last word. Uh, what, what this all keeps coming back to is uh, this is public land and we've got to find a, the correct way for public involvement and public consensus building close to the ground out here in the West. Now, uh, BLM has been around uh, uh, in its modern form uh, since the Taylor, Taylor Grazing Act, and uh, we haven't found it. We've kind of headed back and forth in a lot of different directions, and uh, when, when these controversies start, if there's not consensus, uh, pretty soon uh, you've got the lobby groups in Washington. When I say lobby groups, I mean environmentalists, I mean the Cattlemen's Association, I mean the International uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, uh, Group that represents uh, uh, sportsmen, and they wind up uh, with their knives drawn at each other in Washington, and the result is always less than satisfactory. It's always unpredictable, and one side wins, then the other side uh, in the next four years wins, and ultimately the losers are the people in the West. So the issue is public lands, public participation, how do we put together a culture on the ground that involves everyone, that generates uh, some, some consensus and some meaningful direction. It's a big challenge. Can it be done? Uh, it has to be done. There isn't any other way. Let's go to Colorado Springs. Uh, Bruce, are you there? Yes, I am. You got a question for us? Yes, I do. All uh, right. Secretary Babbitt, uh, this is you, 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 you can the, call uh, me Bruce, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bruce, that's fine. Uh, let me go ahead. I'm representing the Colorado Front Range uh, Resource Advisory Council, and our question to you this morning is what is the current status of pending legislation which may affect the future of the RAC process, uh, i.e. the Domenici Bill and the Allard Bill? Uh, Bruce, <clears throat> the answer is I don't know. And uh, Someone told me, you know, uh, he who looks into a crystal ball is going to wind up eating broken glass. And there's, there's just no telling how this thing's going uh, to come out. Uh, uh, and my guess is it won't be resolved uh, for at least uh, uh, probably till, till the end of November. Uh, and uh, so your guess is as good as mine. Let's go to Bakersfield, California. <coughs> good morning, Scott. You're on the air. Good morning. Uh, correction, this is Bill Mays. We're here in uh, sunny Bakersfield, sun standing tall. Well, good morning, Bill. Uh, question for the Secretary. How will recommended outcomes by the RACs and instituted by BLM staff be viewed by other state and federal agencies? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, because I, I think in a in a sense, we are uh, kind of out ahead of the pack here in the, in the best sense of that word, and I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, really proud of that. Uh, to make that specific, uh, the issue I hear is what about the Forest Service? Uh, uh, and what about uh, ranches uh, that have uh, duplicate permits uh, and, uh, on high and low country? Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the Forest Service, and, and I think that all of us are feeling that we ought to be working toward the day when uh, a permittee uh, in effect gets one permit uh, from the federal land management agencies in a process that is kind of consensus driven and in effect recognizes that you really can't have differing land management policies on the same uh, uh, grazing allotment in any really meaningful sense and uh, that the rancher ought to uh, really have kind of a one-stop deal. Uh, we're making some progress. So we've actually got some cross-management uh, deals that, that Mike can tell you about, I think mostly up in the Pacific Northwest. But uh, uh, So I hope what we do here will, will, will kind of encourage that uh, kind of effect. Uh, it'll, it'll take some time, Mike. Uh, um, Bill, let me just uh, say that, uh, you know, 
I know we're throwing around a lot of, so there's some esoteric words like, you know, common uh, solutions for the common good and things like that. But if you really, if you really think about it, uh, the things that work catch on. And uh, if you, you take a look at a watershed, an ecosystem, uh, a county, whatever the, the piece of geography that you're talking about is, uh, what's right for the land and the people in that piece of geography will work and others will want to do it as well. And, and we've talked about how this isn't easy, and, and that's, that's correct, and we've got to just continue to, to really work at that. But uh, some of these things are catching on, and uh, things like uh, we talk about blurring the lines and the need to blur the lines between agencies. I can give you a couple of examples of some things the Forest Service and BLM are doing that, that uh, Bruce mentioned. Uh, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, we're, you know, we're sharing uh, positions, uh, we're having people uh, work and essentially do the job of, uh, of both agencies, if you will. We've got places where a, a district ranger might be a, a BLM resource area manager and share the staffs. So we've got other places where uh, in Colorado there's an area where the, the BLM is do, doing the range management because that's the expertise that we have and the Forest Service is doing the uh, timber management. And the reason we're doing that is because it's cheaper it makes sense. The people like it. The employees are getting used to it, and uh, they're getting to like it more and more. And uh, I think it's these are the kinds of things that, if it's the right thing to do, and we approach it in a sound, uh, sensible way, it'll catch on. Let's go to Colorado, Montrose, Colorado. Gary, you're on the air. You got a question for us? Yes, we do. This is Gary from Gunnison County, and here in Southwest Colorado. We're wondering what kinds of flexibility can we build into the standards and guidelines? It, the question seems to relate to how specific they are and what landscape scale do the standards and guidelines operate on? Well, look, I, I want to take a shot at that because uh, during those eight weeks that uh, uh, I was a weekly visitor to Colorado uh, uh, about a year ago, uh, we had a lot of discussion about that, and, and particularly in the context of uh, Western Colorado, and uh, it really um, drove a lot of our thinking. The, the answer simply is that you can make them as site-specific uh, as uh, there is any sort of justification uh, uh, for doing. We heard a lot of discussion about this, particularly from the people around Gunnison and to some degree down, uh, 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 down in your area. Colorado's a great example. I mean, the guidelines for the Front Range aren't going to have much to do uh, uh, with the Western Slope. And, uh, Arizona is a nice example for that matter, and, and so, are, so are most of the states. Um, and that's really the, the rationale behind this, is uh, as we move into these guidelines, uh, I think we ought to assume that we can slice them uh, in whatever way fits the land. Now, uh, obviously, as you slice them, you've got to, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, address the issue of, of having meaningful guidelines. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I heard a lot of people saying, look, you can't have uniform guidelines about uh, uh, how far salt blocks uh, should uh, be located from riparian areas. And I'm saying, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but now we've got the question of uh, saying, well, uh, is it appropriate to begin dealing with those issues uh, in a specific context uh, in uh, particular drainages? And I think the answer is uh, uh, yes, and uh, I invite you to try. So you don't think throughout the program uh, we're playing favorites. We're going to go to LaGrande, Oregon. But what everybody needs to be aware of is that we have three resource advisory councils uh, from Oregon, Washington, meeting at that one location. So we'll probably be taking more calls from that location, make sure all three resource advisory councils get a question. So Lillian and LaGrand, you're on the air. Uh, I'm with the Birds Paiute Tribe, and I'm um, with Southeastern Resource Advisory Committee. And my, my question is, what are, my own. Uh, what are the federal grazing leasing fees now? And then will the fees be standard for federal and uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs? And what is the difference between the Bureau and uh, the federal standards? The BIA has been leasing tribal lands by the acreage. So could you please answer this and why, why, the, why the difference? Okay, well, generally, uh, the BIA is a trustee <clears throat> for a tribe, and the tribe uh, basically can, can lease its land on whatever terms and conditions it chooses to lease. I mean, it, it's just that simple. That's a decision uh, for the tribe, uh, just as it would be for a state landowner uh, or 
uh, a private landowner. Now, uh, there are some uh, tribes uh, which have BLM leases, uh, <clears throat> mostly uh, adjacent to reservations, and obviously uh, the BLM uh, a, a lease rate would, would apply there. Now, uh, I was expecting a question, uh, you know, what about lease rates? And uh, not having heard that question generally, uh, I will now uh, ask the question uh, and see if we can answer. The decision that the department made uh, last year uh, was simply to set the grazing fee issue aside and say that's something for the Congress to debate. Um, and I'll tell you frankly why. We couldn't find any consensus on this. And it wasn't for lack of trying. I mean, I was, we went through every kind of contortion, talked about it, looked at different ideas, looked at state things, looked at incentive leases, looked at everything. And the more we talked, the less consensus we had. And what I finally said was, look, you want my opinion? The management issues are a thousand times more important than the grazing fee issue. And if we're going to do one thing on my watch, we're going to get this collective decision making uh, and the management culture working because it's a thousand times more important and I don't want this to fall apart uh, because of the grazing uh, uh, fee issue. So uh, the bottom line is I'm out of that one. Uh, that's for the Congress. Let's go to Las Vegas next. Good morning, Susan. How are you today? Good morning. I'm fine. Thanks. Good. You got a question? Yeah, I do. Great. I think you've answered it sort of, but wanted to find out if um, the RACs are going to be giving um, recommendations for any specific actions that BLM must take, or are we just uh, giving you input for some general guidelines? Well, I, I, I'm going to let Mike <clears throat> tell you, uh, give, give you the real answer. In the meantime, uh, I can't resist, you know, sort of just uh, kind of talking. Uh, I think you can uh, sort of figure out that mix uh, pretty much as you want. Now, uh, you know, th there's a point at which it seems to me that um, getting too specific uh, sort of re reduces the prospects for success. I mean, if there's a, uh, a dispute over permit conditions, for example, that's really an enforcement decision. And uh, Iraq weighing in on that uh, might or might not really even be legal. Uh, but uh, it seems to me to be very productive to say, uh, what is the policy on permit uh, enforcement? Uh, uh, you know, when do you, uh, by what criteria do you, do you say this is uh, an extreme drought situation and we've got to make adjustments uh, in stocking rates? Uh, 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 stuff like that is, is really the essence of what this is all about. Okay, Mike, tell us what it's well, really about. I'd say the answer is both, but what I hope uh, you focus on is I hope you focus on uh, on the big picture stuff and, and start out with uh, with the broader base things, and because that's the area that that it appears to me uh, that the most can be accomplished, and I would hope that uh, uh, that that will build trust over time, and uh, the more trust that that we have being built between the various entities. Uh, in the area and BLM, I think the uh, the less need to want to micromanage or question decisions because hopefully there won't be the need to question decisions because things will things will get to working and they'll work better and better over time. Let's uh, head to Wyoming. Are we going fast enough for you guys? <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> bang, right. bang, bang. Uh, uh, Caroline, you're on the air. Uh, this is Carolyn Passano from Casper, Wyoming. My question uh, centers on something that was addressed earlier, which is trust and consensus. I know that we'll be talking about policy and science, but people and relationships are really the bottom line. And if uh, we're going to develop trust and consensus, at least to enhance each of those, we're going to need stability in the RAC membership as well as with BLM personnel. I'm wondering with one year appointments if this will bring the stability we're looking for so that we can come to trust and consensus. Well, let me just say that, that I really agree with you and you know I've, I've spent a lot of time talking with uh, Governor Sullivan about this trust and consensus issue and I uh, had a long discussion uh, with Governor, Governor Geringer last week and, and he again uh, made this point and uh, he, he, was, he was pretty direct about it. He says look we got a problem out in the West. Uh, there isn't uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, trust in a lot of quarters. Uh, we've really drifted into uh, you know, tremendously antagonistic uh, uh, position. We've got a lot of time to make up. Um, I agree we ought to have continuity. Um, and I, I guess what I would say to you is uh, 
where there are uh, uh, one-year uh, appointments. Are, are all of the RAC members one-year appointments at this point? No. No. Uh, okay. Now, now for the facts. Uh, well, let's turn to Mike yeah. because I don't think that's yeah. always the case. Yeah. Well, um, <coughs> what our objective is uh, is to, to stagger the appointments so yeah. you don't have the turnover of the entire Resource Advisory Council occur at once so you have continuity. So I think I think the uh, initially the point that you're you're making and the point about continuity, uh, the reason for that is so we don't have them all turning over at the same time. Now the other uh, point that you brought up about continuity and stability in, in BLM employees in an area is a is an important one and one that I've been concerned about for a long time because you know I too came from the culture and agencies where it seemed like you moved more often than you wanted to and, and you had to move uh, for various reasons and uh, we're slowing that down significantly and not only in BLM but in all the agencies number one is we can't afford it uh, because moving people is expensive uh, but I think you know we're we're beginning to understand based upon the experiences of the 70s and the 80s that uh, the importance of continuity and that these these uh, BLM employees and Forest Service employees and all the employees of the federal agencies are really important parts of local communities. Uh, their, their kids go to school with your kids. Uh, there's a level of trust that's, that's very important there and they're an important part of the community and we need to fully uh, uh, recognize that. They're not just people that sort of drift in and drift out. And uh, so what I think you're going to see over the long haul is a, a significant slowing in, uh, in transfers of people in and out of uh, uh, areas. I think it's, uh, it's probably been a bad policy uh, over the last uh, 10 to 15 to 20 years and we need to slow it down. Let's head back to uh, La Grande, Oregon. Bob, are you still there? Bob? Yes. Uh, Bob, we want to thank you for your tenacity because Bob has been on hold for over 30 minutes. So tenacity pays off, Bob. Let, let's hear the question. Good. First of all, uh, we are well represented here in La Grande by four service people, so we thank those people for coming. Our question is uh, why the production was getting racks up and running uh, when this very mechanism for communication, the former advisory councils, uh, were dissolved by this administration? Well, uh, what was dissolved by this administration was the uh, grazing advisory councils. Now, uh, uh, we did that for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, there was some question uh, as to uh, whether or not there was legal authority for them. But more importantly uh, was this notion that what we really want to do is have all of the users together uh, in one forum so that we can build this consensus. Now, uh, there, under the Federal Land Policy Management Act, there have been advisory committees, and in that sense, I, I can see your skepticism because uh, what you're basically saying is, well, uh, these multiple use committees uh, existed in the past. Uh, and the answer is they did. Uh, some of them were used by the state and, and, and district managers and were quite effective. Uh, many of them uh, were seldom heard from and almost never met and even the members in some cases really didn't know that they existed. So why all the hype? Because we got to make these work and we got to persuade ourselves and you and the world at large that this is a new start, that this is meaningful stuff, that these advisory committees are going to have a real role and uh, that's the reason uh, that we're out here saying uh, we're going to lay a lot of chips on this idea and we're not going to let it just fade away. Let's go back to Nevada. Rose, are you there in Reno? Yes. Welcome. You're on the air. Thank you. Uh, greetings from the Great Basin. Well, thank you. Um, there are a number of legislative attacks on public land. Will there even be public land? after this Congress is over. Oh, yeah, Rose, come on. I, I think I know who this caller is because I, uh, uh, I spent a little time in the Great Basin. C come on, will there be public lands after this session? Yeah, of course there will. Now, uh, <laughs> let me just say a, a, a serious word or two. It's an old tradition in the West. It's been going on for 100 years to have a kind of sagebrush rebellion discussion. Uh, we had one under Teddy Roosevelt. We had a big one in the 1920s. We had another one in the 1950s. Uh, we had one during the time that I was a, a governor in the 1970s. We got another one today. Now, uh, I'm not into a lot of predictions, but I am uh, pretty interested in history, and I can tell you that 
uh, I think the chances are very good that uh, the public lands are, are here to stay. Now, uh, and, and indeed, I think after, uh, history says to me that after each one of these discussions we've had, in many ways, uh, the system has gotten better as a result of kind of, uh, you know, having a little dust up over uh, all of these issues and trotting them out and, and, and arguing them uh, kind of like in a Japanese uh, kabuki drama once each generation. Now, uh, will there be changes? Well, uh, possibly yes, there always have been, but uh, uh, I don't buy this sort of alarmist uh, uh, sort of stuff that we're headed to doom and perdition. Uh, uh, public lands are going to be here, and um, I'm optimistic that we're going to find larger areas of consensus uh, and that. I, I guess lastly, I, I would say, uh, look, you want to fight these issues out about changing the laws. Uh, be my guest. I, uh, I mean, I don't expect members of RACS to desert their legislative views at the door. Uh, but I would hope that the issues about, you know, uh, should we convey public lands to the states? Should we have uh, more wilderness? Should we amend the mining law? Really ought to, that debate ought to take place because uh, it'll ultimately be resolved by the Congress. What we ought to be doing in these forums is saying, look, we've got a set of laws. They may be changed, but the real issue is how we administer these laws on the land and adopt the regulations and how the BLM does its job. And that's what we want to find uh, consensus uh, and discussion and advice about in these uh, particular forums. Do you want to argue with that or not? I, I won't argue with that one, Larry. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we're probably going to take a couple more calls, and the next call uh, is going to be here in, in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Val, you're on the air. Good morning, gentlemen, and congratulations to all fellow RAC members. Sir, uh, Secretary Babbitt, you're, in your introductory statements, um, there was an emphasis on ranching, mining, and forestry resources and use of public lands. There was no mention in the same breath of traditional cultural property, which has little, if anything, to do with uh, economic gain. Or, uh, will or can cultural or spiritual concerns honestly carry the same weight as economic interests? Well, I, I think that's really an interesting question, and it's one that has been neglected uh, uh, very much in the past, because when we talk about public lands and public use, clearly included among that, uh, ought and I, I, I think we, we really should make a clear statement uh, to Native Americans that that includes your use of the land, uh, and it includes uh, respect and uh, for and access to uh, traditional cultural and religious sites. Uh, on public land, and uh, so the answer there is, I, I think, a clear yes. That is a, uh, th that is in fact a, an important uh, uh, use of the land, and in most cases, uh, it can be accommodated, I think, with uh, thoughtful management uh, by these folks. Uh, uh, and just because it hasn't always happened in the past doesn't mean we can't do it in the future. Okay, our last call will go to Riverside, California. Welcome, Steve. You got a question for us? I sure do. Great. Good morning, Mr. Secretary, gentlemen. Good morning. I'm from the California Desert District. Uh, the final BLM grazing regulations state that the Secretary will provide half of available funds to the state and district from which the funds were derived. How will the funds be allocated between state and district? What does available funds mean? And will the advisory councils have a say in how the funds will be spent? Uh, the answer to the last part is yes. Now, Mike, uh, enlighten us. Well, um, you know, I think going back to the needs of the land and uh, uh, part of your say in advising uh, uh, the BLM folks uh, in the, the local communities and the, the resource area of the district that you're in, uh, you know, I think it's taking a look at what the landscape needs and prioritizing what those needs are. And that will ultimately determine how those uh, funds will be spent will be uh, spent as far as any specific unique uh, unique formula or, or anything like that. I just, just like to focus on the needs of the land in order of priority. But, but the RACs will participate in that in making recommendations to how those funds are spent. Yes. Good, good. Okay. At this point, we're concluding our first call-in session. Those of you who did not get your questions answered, there'll be more time later in the program for you to call back. 
What we'd like to do now is turn our focus to the topic of standards and guidelines. And Mike, I understand you have some comments on the fundamentals of rangeland health. Well, let me just uh, say, Larry, it's, it's like uh, when I think of, of terms like standards and guidelines and, and fundamentals and, and ecosystem management, what I my plea to, to everyone is that we, we really keep this as simple as we possibly can and focus on the endpoints of, of where we're going. And, of course, you know, the fundamentals of rangeland health really talk about the, fun the fundamentals of uh, a functioning ecosystem, uh, building stream banks, uh, preventing soil erosion, uh, diverse native plant communities, all those kinds of things are, are really the, the functioning riparian zones, uh, the energy flow, and all of those things what we're really talking about. And it's the kind of thing, you know, Bruce, that, that we could get a bunch of PhDs in here and really make this complicated. And, and I hope that we really, really avoid that and really, really keep it simple. Um, back to what I said earlier about the basic functions of watersheds, to store uh, to catch, store, and release water. I, I think that's about as basic as we can get. Now, obviously, we've got to apply the best science and technology that we have to that, but, but the point is, I think, you know, we can look at a stream and we can, we can look at a, a piece of rangeland just like we can look at a forest, and, and we, can, uh, uh, we can sort of tell what kind of condition it's in. And then we apply the science, and we, that brings us efficiency, the ability to prioritize where we need to go, and this sort of thing. So. Um, I guess that's a long way of saying keep it simple. But the other uh, couple points I'd like to make is, um, uh, number one, uh, I look at standards as uh, sort of performance measures. Is the land performing what we want it to perform? And then uh, what actions can we take uh, to get it there if it's not? And uh, with that, I, uh, I think, you know, we're going to, we're, I'm going to have a session here, look at a video, and uh, have another question and answer period on standards and guides, and we can get, it into, get into it more deeply than that. But uh, I think, you know, committing to working together, looking at the landscape, the health of the land, uh, uh, is, is what this is all about. Okay. As you can see, assisting with the development of standards and guidelines will be one of your major tasks. To give you more information, we have prepared this background piece.